Hey Rovers, well now that the ring frames are for the most part entirely installed, I can start thinking about the floor system. The Wave Rover 650, a design based on my single-handed ocean voyages. She's small, light, but easy to build, and strong enough to cross any ocean. My name's Alan Mulholland, and this is the Wave Rover Story. Well, I managed to get myself some really good quality white oak, and it was actually uh, sourced very, very locally on Prince Edward Island. Now, by using this to connect the bottom of the remaining ring frames that are in the living area of the cabin, I will be able to increase the headroom up to, well, pretty much six feet if you're standing on the bottom, and about five foot ten if you're standing on top of these ring frames. Anyway, as always, there's a lot to do. Time to crack on. So I'm here with Vernon Craig of Craig's Woodworking, and he managed to mill up all the ash that I need for the battens for the sail and some white oak as well that we're going to use for the floor structure. Vernon, can you just tell me where did this wood actually come from? Well, the white oak came from Kings County PEI and the ash came from Wellington area when they cut out the power line for the windmill energy. So the ash is basically more less than 50 kilometers away and the oak came from no more than about 150 kilometers away. That would be correct. Yeah, thanks very much, Vernon. Yeah, no trouble. So this is the white oak that I have, a nice piece. It's two inches by an inch and three quarters. Now, it's going to go down across and form timbers that will connect right across here and here pretty much everywhere where there's a ring frame I have to make that connection so the difference between what we already have down here and these is these are actually connection points for the keel these are the keel timbers and this will be for the ring frames to connect the ring frames together now because of that I'm going to change the orientation so the two inch height which is this direction right here will be the vertical edge right now these guys the two inch is across here to give me a better bolting surface so um, anyway the second consideration I have to have is since these will be located all the way from you know right back aft all the way to the watertight bulkhead right here they're going to have to have some sort of limber hole or a hole located in them to let water travel all the way forward. So these keel timbers, I don't want to put any limber holes in. So the only limber holes I'll have to put in will be for the, let's see, for the ring frame, one, two, three, possibly four. So I'm thinking a half inch too wide right now but a half inch located one at each end and then another one in the center or maybe four total one at each end and two sort of in the central region um, I'm going to think on that a little bit further the second complication is I have a drill press that doesn't have a chuck so we're going to tackle that right now so I'll need my old drill press to drill those limber holes in the floor timbers. Now, as you can see, what we have here is just a tapered, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, tapered shaft, I guess. And this is called a chuck taper or a Jacob's chuck taper. And I've measured it with my micrometer and found out the uh, diameter at the top and the bottom and then I ordered up this which is a chuck. A chuck is the piece that you stick your drill bit into. Now with a bit of luck this will go on here. Now I've never 
put one on before I took my old one off. Oh, look at that. It stays already. But I know it has to be tightened up. So uh, I asked my <laughs> engineering friend, Brian Smythe. I just got off the phone with him. He said, just tap it on. I said, with a block of wood? And he said, yeah, yeah, a block of wood. That'll even be better. So that's what we're going to do and try to get it set and then get on with the project. Okay, so I've just taken the chuck. So it's just friction that holds this on. And it on sort of snugly there. Don't have much room for swing. Yeah, that's pretty good. Bear in mind that when you drill something, the pressure is all downward, so it's tightening this up, if anything. It's not, there's no tension on it. So, yeah, I guess that'll work. All right, time to put it into action. Well, I managed to get one hole cut and start in on the second, but then this happened. The spindle is spinning but the arbor isn't. And when I took a look at it, I found that this pulley system, which has a, a keyway in it, it might be hard to see, uh, it had come loose. So what we need to do is, we'll just unplug this first. We need to line up that keyway with the keyway in this. Uh, it goes in this way. The, the one pulley is the exact opposite of the other. And then there's the key itself. So I'll just line that up. Okay, so we have it on and we have the key in there. And the key is bottomed out. Now I'm no expert in this. And now there's an Allen screw. I'll just bring that up a little higher to line it up. Yes, that's it. Okay, we're back in business. Just a matter of putting the belt back on. Let's see. Okay, we're on. Let's see if we want to go to the actually why don't we leave it there? That's uh, doo -doo -doo. that would be 1100 RPMs for the spindle. It looks pretty good. So when you go to drill a hole, one of the best things you can do is, well, first of all, you have to mark it. So I've marked a center line right here. And then I've come up half the diameter of the bit. So I'm using a, a half inch bit. So I'm coming up a quarter inch. Then this is the key to getting a good hole. Take an awl, that's just, it's just a, uh, something that looks like a screwdriver with a hardened point on it. And then get that center point and make, make yourself a little divot. And that will allow the bit to hit exactly that point and it's not going to wander. All right, we'll now drill that hole. So even though white oak is quite a dense wood, I can get a really nice hole just by using a regular carpenter's spade bit. You know, these are just very inexpensive bits, but you have to make sure the wood is solid and you give yourself that little point with the awl. <laughs> The 
you can see we get a very very nice hole dead center now I need to trim off the shoulders of this to make it more of a horseshoe shape okay so now I'll just square this off to the edge of the hole so right to there bring a line across do the same on the other side Now you could use a variety of tools to, to cut this. You could use your skill saw. But I have this little saw that I picked up on sale a little while ago, actually at the beginning of the project. And it's really good for, it's really good for making these type of cuts. They're relatively inexpensive and they're, you know, they're, I'm not going to say they're really accurate, but they're as accurate as you hold it. Great, now we'll just hit that with the sander. So now we want to put a nice round over on the top edge, as I've done right here, and I'll do it on this edge for you. And we also want to round over the entrance of where the water will go through. So that's what I've done here, here and here. All right, so a router, you should know this, spins in this direction. So we always want to make sure that we push our wood against the router. That's the safest thing to do. If you, if you router with the router, it just tends to really accelerate stuff and pull it through. All right, we'll start with the easy one. So you can see that the routering of the top edge, which will be the thing that you'll see, it's nice, there's no burns, but you're seeing burn marks on these, which is telling me that I'm going too slow when I'm cutting these, but it's like a catch-22. When you're really small like this, you have to go sm slow to line it up so you don't end up ruining the flat edge. And I want to keep this flat because this is my gluing surface. Now, some of you were curious what my router setup is like and it's really quite simple. I made just, uh, I glued up two pieces of plywood to make it extra thick. It was half inch plywood I had at the time, so it's a one inch thick uh, top. Put a sheet of Arbrite, it was just again leftover stuff. And it's because of the ply that was available and the Arbrite that dictated the size of this. Also, I wanted to keep it small because I took this with me when I, uh, on my first voyage across the Pacific because I worked as a carpenter in Australia. So the only thing holding this down are these little, uh, they're called chair rail connectors. Ugh. I must not know my own strength. Okay, there's a normal one. They look like that. And... You just drill a hole and you put this lag uh, screw in and then you just put a washer on it, put it over onto a flat part of the base and then tighten it up. I have three of them on here in total. That should do the trick. It has never failed me. I built this as an apprentice and, and let's see, uh, that would have been back in probably 92 that I built this. So that's 820... And 22, 24, 25 years ago, and it's been great. You know, a router table, of course, would be better, but it takes up space. This you can actually take with you on a boat. All right, I've got a lot more to do. Time to crack on. 
Okay, so there it is. This is just a test fit to make sure everything's lining up and everything looks pretty good. There's no way water is going to get trapped behind that. It's going to flow nicely no matter which way the boat is healing. And as I was talking about earlier, you can see that there's a gap between the side of the bunk and the wood, the white oak, on each side. It's about uh, a little more than an eighth. It's probably two and a half millimeters or so. And that's in order to get a good bit of epoxy and filler in there so that I have a really good glue joint. And, uh, you know, because really this is under a compressive load. This is the connection to the rest of the ring frame. So we want to make sure that the ring frame is connected all the way around. So it comes back down, it runs underneath the bunk and then connects back up to this beam. All right, I've got several more to make, time to crack on. I'm here in the glue up room with Mrs. Rover. She's mixing up some glue, just put it in a baggie for me. And we're gluing these guys right here, these beautiful pieces of oak. And this one, we're, we've primed some of these. There's an order that they have to go in so I can work. And then we put glue on them and spread it out. So there's Wave Rover. I've got the floor timbers in and they're being glued up. I've just, I'm just showing you how, or the steps I have to take in order to get the temperatures I need. I have two electric heaters inside heating up the space. And I have a tarp over top of Wave Rover, plus I have blankets big big heavy blankets tossed on top to keep the heat in and it is working despite minus 16 last night it was a nice 15 degrees inside the boat okay so the power cords especially inside the boat they're becoming a bit of a nightmare because uh, of the you know number of cords and tripping over them so i have an idea here are uh, two power stations. Power stations basically mean a battery bank with an inverter that can operate uh, DC or AC tools. And on the left is the Blue Eddy, and I'll be talking more about that later on when I start talking about the electrical system of Wave Rover and how I'm going to work it into the, into the whole system. But on the right, I have the Pecron, and Pecron's like one of the newer power stations on the block and they sent me uh, this unit to review and I'll, I'm happy to do that. In fact, I feel like I'm becoming a bit of an expert in these uh, portable power stations. So the Pecron uh, can give me 2000 watts of power and the Blue Eddy can give me 2048. But the size difference is huge. You can see the, the Pecron is actually much smaller than the Blue Eddy. But here's the crucial thing. The Pecron is actually only 40 odd pounds, whereas the Blue Eddy is 60 odd pounds. So the Pecron with almost the same capacity is 50% lighter. And that's going to work out just great inside the boat. I'll be using it to uh, power the lights, uh, power the jigsaw, router, small tools that I need inside the boat. And that way I don't have to worry about um, tripping over a bunch of power cords. So what do we have for power? Yep, we've got a whole bunch of these um, 110 volt outlets. So I have no end of, uh, of what I can accomplish with that. Charging this is really easy. I charged it the other night. You just plug in the adapter, which comes with it into a wall outlet and charge it up here. Uh, you'll see me do that over the next few weeks when I need to charge this. But also, if I had solar panels, I can charge this unit directly with solar panels as well. So it's really easy to operate. Just turn the power switch on. Let's see, it might need to hold that a bit longer. There we go. So inside the machine, I have 100% power because I just charged it last night. Um, it tells me... Uh, what the battery looks like and when I plug something in 
it starts it starts you know the countdown begins we we start running through our power so i'll, I'll keep an eye on that and we'll uh we'll sort of test out this unit although i don't see any issues there are heaps of videos online about the pecron which really go over in a more in-depth way all the capacity of it but for most of us all we want to know is Will this unit be able to power my lights and my tools inside the boat? How long will it last? So the how long will it last question, I'll be answering that on an ongoing basis. But again, I don't really see any issues. It's light enough at 40 pounds. I can put it inside the boat. Yeah, this will make my life a whole lot easier. Okay, so I've got the Pecron inside the boat, and if we take a look at this, it says it's uh, drawing 14 watts, and it's probably good somewhere between 64 to 65 hours at that draw. It's drawing that because I have this light plugged in right now. So that's 14 watts, and I have a second one I'll turn on now, and that brings us up to 28, exactly 14 times two. And I get 44 hours of burn time just with these two lights. I mean, that's terrific. That's, uh, you know, most people work a 40 hour week. Can't actually say I do, but that, uh, that's going to be great. You can see that really simplifies the power situation. I don't need to bring cords in. Although uh, for the heater, just down here the heater is a big draw so when i do want heat in here i'll have to plug that into the mains but this will simplify my life greatly plus there's one more thing i want to show you so what i wanted to show you is the dust cover that comes with it so you know building a boat can be a bit of a dusty undertaking as you can see there is uh, a lot of sawdust and debris that gets into the air on a daily basis. So to have this machine inside and not get dust into the fans and works, well, that's just terrific. All right, time to crack on with a little bit of boat building. Well, there we go. The floor timbers are in. And as you can see, we've got the limber holes on the first four. And they're pretty good. They are structural members now connecting the ring frames and the bulkheads into a continuous circle so that we have yet more strength uh, in, in the Wave Rover 650. I'd like to take a moment to honor the Wave Rover benefactors. So what is a benefactor? Well, these folks have made a contribution of $100 US or more to the project and their names will be affixed to a bulkhead inside Wave Rover and will be traveling with me on our circumnavigation. Now these donations truly are much appreciated. Well, the Wave Rover patrons, with their pledges of support, really do make the creation of these videos possible. Now, if you'd like to know more about Wave Rover's patron page and Benefactor's Bulkhead, I have links to both those pages in the video description. Now, another way to help Wave Rover, and it doesn't cost you a dime, is by sharing our content on your social media. So now, as always, Rovers, thanks for watching. one more.